Right, so let's think about the future of money then. What should we do? What are the choices we've got now? Well, obviously, the, the, the minimum people are looking for is bank reform. A lot of people have thought over the last few years have been trying to work on financial inclusion. That is getting people access to new technologies, affordable credit, the whole microcredit thing. That's been one of the, uh, one of the things that people have been trying to do. <coughs> on the other hand, we could go the other way. and we could, th Those first two are kind of reformist things. Uh, the other thing we can do is just abandon money completely and, and, and money in banking completely and try and think of another way of organising ourselves. And a lot of people are thinking along those lines and what can be done. Or we can go for reforming money in some way in, um, at the local level, the national level and the global level. And that sense of reform is much more radical than the, the top two, reforming the banks. I mean, mo monetary reform is, is, is quite a radical thing to want to do. And there's a lot of movements for people asking for, for monetary reform. Right, so let's look at reforming the banks. Is that a possibility? Obviously, again, I don't have to dwell on these very long because there won't be a lot of sympathy in the room for them, I shouldn't think. Stricter regulation, splitting the bank functions, breaking up the banks so they can fail, more capital reserves, living wills in case they fail, limit the bonus culture, impose taxes of various sorts. I mean, these are the things we, we, could, be, we could be doing. But that won't work because not, hardly any of that will work because the system itself is rotten, basically. It won't work because the system is interconnected anyway, and you can split the banks and separate functions, but they, uh, they'll overcome that. They'll find ways around that. It's too profitable not to. Um, that won't necessarily tack it, tackle the bonus culture. Um, the financial sector, its role in society, Adair Turner rather honestly said it would be, at one point he said it was socially useless, at another point he said it was economically useless. Um, the financial sector, just you know, what benefit is it to us at all? Um, so, um, if you do try to reform, banks will try to move even further offshore. The whole financial sector will try to move offshore. And uh, that would risk further <coughs> this, this link. As I've been trying to show you, the banks only work because states and publics underpin it. And if people aim to escape from their... From, if, everybody, if, if everybody tries to work in somebody else's jurisdiction so they can avoid their home regulation, then we will have a completely a free-floating financial sector that will be devastating economically and always in danger of getting into crisis again, but with no state and public base to underpin <coughs> it at all. So that wouldn't be much use. Um, it won't, reform won't work unless we um, do something about shareholder expectations. One of the reasons that banks got so crazy in trying to do and uh, make money in every way they could is because shareholder value became very important. Uh, making money was, 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 was the main aim. And, but that wasn't just the shareholders, it was the savers and the investors. Everybody got to think of their bank balance as somehow an investment. It wasn't, banking wasn't seen as a service, it was seen as, a, as, a, as, as an investment industry. And we know that in, if you try to allow banks to fail, which is the, the make them small enough to fail, we know that the people will go straight to the state for compensation anyway because uh, what will lie behind the smaller f bank failing would be, that the, would be that the state can support its failure and therefore rescue people's deposits, etc. But it, none of it will work if we leave money creation in speculative hands, as it has been for the last 30 years or so. And nothing will stop responsibility being in public hands. It won't solve that problem of private benefit, public responsibility. And the modern banking system will still be confusing private interests with the public function of money creation. I've tried to show how the money system has been hijacked by the financial sector. So um, that really, I think, does it for reform. I don't think you can reform the current system. I, I'll come back to that. I don't think you can reform the current system. I think it's, the system itself is not fit for purpose. It's very fit for its own purposes, but no, not very fit for our purposes as a, as, a, as, a, as a public, as a society. So let's think about, what about financial inclusion then? What if you go down the road of the new technologies? There's a lot of talk about, particularly for monetary reform, whether we can use uh, fo mobile phones, whether this can become a new way of bypassing the, the formal financial system. For instance, some figures here, Bangladesh in 2009, 15% of the population had bank accounts, but 50% have mobile phones. The mo it is true that mobile phone technology is massive. Globally, it's massive. 
and it's and and it's a very very useful technology. I'm sure I was at a, a seminar in London yesterday talking about green money, and talking about the possibility of using mobile phone technology for running alternative kinds of credit systems, monetary systems. There's quite a lot of excitement around mobile phone technology. Uh, you know, I'm a bit of a technophobe, so I'm not sure how it would work. But I mean, there's a lot of talk around there. Um, I just picked up at some point that the Ni Nigeria is, in, is trying to launch a national ID card that will act as a bank card. Um, and India is doing the same thing um, w because they've, they've got the problem of when they try to get benefits to people in, uh, in local communities, they have to go through an agent and the agents rip them off. They can't guarantee the agents will pass it on. So if people have a card or a mobile phone that is in, in their possession, then the person, uh, the, 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 the agency giving out the money, whether it be food uh, stuff or fuel or whatever, or, or money itself, uh, can get it straight to the person's mobile phone or straight to the per that person's identity card and therefore can load their card, as it were. And it don't, you don't have to pass through an agent who will rip them off. Um, but that, I think there's a slight danger that mobile phone companies are going to become bankers. Um, and, and quite, you know, so the technology might take off, but not for reform banking, but for, or reformed money system, but the, the current system will just end up uh, mobile phone companies, like Tesco's become a bank, I'm sure mobile phone companies will become a bank. Um, microcredit, at one point this was seen as the answer to economic development, small scale loans, um, the Grameen Bank, etc. And um, really, this is really something that's already, as it were, past its sell by date, really. Um, you had the very success in the beginning, good repayment rates, but very high interest rates, um, not as high as loan sharks, but much more than ordinary banking systems. And it's led to, prob it hasn't solved the problem of indebtedness. Uh, people are becoming indebted through the microcredit system, particularly women, um, mainly because they're overrepresented among the poor, but also because ideologically it was thought women were the better payers. So they started taking on debts for their families and it just got... Uh, got difficulty and you knew the writing was on the wall for this as a radical measure when commercial banks were cashing in because it was high interest rates effectively it's a form of subprime lending and it's very high interest rates and the, if the commercial banks can make money out of it then obviously it's not uh, it's not going to have the radical uh, uh, end that uh, it was hoped so microcredit is uh, uh, and, and there's a book um, uh, come out recently just studying where um, uh, money is given directly to communities, not uh, as, as, as debt, but given directly as, as pensions, as uh, child benefits or whatever, family benefit. Um, and it's being done in Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, uh, all over. And they find that's much the quickest way to get a local economy going, much, more, much better than microcredit. Just give them the money. The book is called Just Give the Money to the Poor. And it seems to work much better. Um, so let's think of more radical ways of looking at it. Um, in my earlier work, I did mention a, a lecture that I've done for Schumacher College, which is on YouTube. It deals with my sort of ecofeminism work, which is much more to do with ecology and green issues, which I haven't really dwelt on here at all. But, I mean, one thing that money does is divide what, what is valued within the money system and what is not. So uh, you can set up the concept of economic man, who can also be a woman, uh, against what you could call women's work, which can also be done by men. So I'm using them generically, the notion of economic man as again, and, and the notion of women's work. Um, setting up market value against subsistence, setting up personal wealth against social reciprocity, setting up the value of able-bodied workers as against to those who are just a, a cost, the sick, the needy, the old, the young. Um, uh, uh, looking uh, to exploit labour and intellect, but not interested in the body or the needs of the body. Uh, looking for exploitable resources, but not interested in ecosystems or wild nature. Interesting knowledge, if it can be sold, if you can sell international property rights, but not interested in feelings, emotions, wisdom, unless these uh, uh, can be marketed. So basically, the things that society values are the things that are marketed, and the things that the money system doesn't uh, value are the things that most of us would want to find a way of, uh, of, of at least meeting the needs of that sector, but also the benefits of this sector, social reciprocity. How much more beneficial that is than personal wealth? Your, your strength is in your society, not in yours. We've talked about 
the, the, the kind of pot of money you yourself can have. And then there's a couple of images here which are, are, are quite nice. Um, this is uh, the iceberg model of capitalist pat called capitalist patriarchal economics. But it shows that the, way, the money system, which is really capital and wage labour, um, what's called the visible economy, is really the money economy, uh, which uh, Maria Mies argues, um, and uh, it's Veronica Benholt Thompson. Actually, I've said Benholt, it's Benholt Thompson. Um, uh, it, it, the, the tip of the iceberg and underneath lies all the other sectors of society, home workers, the informal sector, child labour, subsistence, uh, peasants work. This, of course, still is a money system, um, but it's not been the more formal. So you've got the formal uh, above, above the, 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 the water, as it were. Then you've got all the underpinning, more exploitative areas. Then you've got peasants work, then you've got housework. Then you've got colonial um, uh, extraction and exploitation, and then you've got nature underpinning it all. And another version of that is the famous uh, Hazel Henderson's The Economy as a Layered Cake. And she's done much the same thing. Official market economy uh, as the icing on the cake. Private sector cons uh, production, employment, consumption, investment and savings. Then the public area, defence, state, local government, public infrastructure, etc., then the underground economy, the informal economy, and then all the non-money areas, the sweat equity, do-it-yourself bartering, uh, social, familial, community, unpaid household and parenting, volunteering, sharing, mutual aid, care for the old and sick, home place production for use, subsistence agriculture, and then finally, again, the natural uh, underpinning system, nature and all the needs of nature. So... I think before we do anything about the money system, we've got to think about economy. We've got to think about reclaiming <coughs> economy. And I'm, my aim is to try and devise a money system that can produce the concept of a sufficiency economy. Economy with enough, but not having to grow and interact and, and exchange unnecessarily. So a sufficiency economy would mean living within social and ecological limits. And to do that, you'd need to take account of the whole of human lives and the natural environment. That is... You don't just take the icing, you don't just take the iceberg, you don't just take the economic man's side of the, of the, uh, of the divide. You, you have to have an economic structure that can integrate all aspects of society. So you need to take account of the whole of human lives and the natural environment. And particularly you need to integrate what I call women's work. Uh, that is to do with all the work that needs to be done to keep, to keep human societies on the road. Or the, or the caring, or the, or the, 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 the um, hygiene work, or the, or, or the emotional support that has to be done. Um, and so what the, the concept, the notion, a more useful notion than economy is provisioning. Because if you have the notion of provisioning a sufficiency society, it embraces all aspects of human nourishing, paid and unpaid, and including nourishing the natural environment as well. So provisioning is, uh, is a much more comprehensive notion. So another alternative then is to abandon money. Can we abandon money to get to our notion of sufficiency society? Would that be the answer? Can we, can we sort of start from scratch, blank sheet, and see what we can do? Um, now, good, the reasons for this, of course, is that love of money is the root of all evil and greed and usury and exploitation. We've all know, gone through that. We know money distorts human relationships and the relationship with nature. We only value the things we can sell. We know society is dominated by those who control the money system or have the most money. And we know that the search for profit drives capitalism and wage labour. That is, the, that money... It's not a case of commodities interacting through money as a convenience so that people can exchange commodities. That would be CMC commodity to money to commodity. What we have here is money purely invested, not to provision, but only because it will create, a, through the exchange system, it will create more money. So the motivation isn't provisioning, motivation is building is, is, is more money. And we all will all be, I think, familiar with that notion. But of course, we've got the worst position of all world, which is money, invested in money to make more money. And uh, somebody, I was doing a course down at Schumacher, and somebody just said, well, MMM, make more money. 
<laughs> which is uh, I hadn't spotted that one myself, but I thought that was quite good. So, so, and this is the worst one of well, not necessarily. I mean, Ted Sandy's uh, emailed me, and I take his point that actually, it, in ecological terms, this is not so damaging as this one, because if this one you're you're producing goods and services unnecessarily and using resources in order to make your money, you're probably better off doing this one, which is just playing with money. Um, it's, it's very destabilising, but ecologically it might be less damaging. Socially it'll be, it'll be very damaging, but ecologically it may not be so damaging. But we don't want either. We don't want social damage and we don't want ecological damage. So, um, carrying on with the problem with money, the desire and need for money leads, for, leads to people becoming indebted. We know that. Um, we also know that... Um, we have to do things we don't really want to do in order to earn the money we need to live the lives we want to live. So we may not choose, well, people may not be doing the, the tasks, the jobs they choose to do. They're just doing whatever they can do to get money. And of course, this is why people are ripping off the copper on the, uh, on the um, railway lines and everything. They're, they're, they're taking away um, Barbara Hepworth uh, metal um, um, sculptures and melting them down just to turn them into money. So, you know, this is what, when people just want money, they'll do anything, destroy anything to make money. We know that money boundaries exclude externalities, things, they don't, things that they don't pay for, but need, they, the, the, the system needs to support it. Unpaid work, so-called women's work, ecological damage. So what type of economy could be money-free? Should we return to some kind of subsistence self-provisioning? Is that the answer? And... Um, th that sort of system. And I'm trying to think through subsistence economies, and I think we can distinguish subsistence as a means of production, that is, non-market, small-scale, homespun, the kind of Gandhian notion of going back to provisioning ourselves. So that's one notion of, of subsistence. That would be pretty tough for a society like ours with 60 million people. It would be pretty, pretty hard to do. So you could think more of subsistence in more exchange terms, in terms as a means of circulation. That is, not that we all go and do everything for ourselves and grow our own tomatoes and dig our own potatoes, but we have subsistence as a means of circulation. That is not for profit. Let schemes, local money, time banks. So we could get ourselves out of the money system without necessarily having to um, go back to make, you know, weaving our own clothes. Or... You, I, I, I would prefer to think of subsistence, I think a slightly more general way of looking at it, as just sufficiency. That is a slow economy based on wants. Uh, uh, should be based on needs, not wants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how about local money then? Would that, would that be a, subsist a kind of subsistence in the <coughs> sense of trying to build our local economy? And of course, a lot of people in the room will be interested in that and trying to do that. Shall we exchange as much as possible outside the money systems or the profit-based market system by things like let's, time banks, local money? Um, local production for local need, concepts like that. Or, or use cooperative and communal forms of organisation. Now, we know this can be done because local money schemes have been very successful in the past, particularly in the 30s. There were a lot of local money schemes, very, very uh, successful because people were desperate. And I think, um, uh, and therefore they, they used them because there was really nothing else. And uh, they were often closed down. In America, they were closed down. In um, some very uh, famous ones in Austria uh, uh, were closed down because they were so successful. The local money... Uh, began to produce a, a very successful state. So we know it can be done. And we know there's all kinds of experiments in local money. Um, but we also know that local money systems sometimes aren't successful and sometimes a lot of enthusiasm gets it going and it never quite takes off. And I think, uh, I think the difference is between the ones that are done... I think you need some public authority. The, the secret of, of the ones that were <coughs> successful was, was there was some public authority that undertook to get involved, like, like mostly the local councils are the equivalent. That is, you need an authority base. We've talked about the fact that money systems do need an authority base. It needn't be authoritarian, but it does need something that people trust, a, a system people trust. So, um, uh, so it can be done, but um, if it's done just as a social network, which often it is, it doesn't work as well. So there are problems with local money. 
There's a problem of limited use outside of the local community, a problem of acceptance, often a problem of the range of activities covered because it doesn't really meet the, the basic needs of people. This t tends to have to be met uh, in the formal economy. And it's not very practical, really, to abandon more general systems of money in urbanised societies uh, like um, you know, mi millions of people in cities, whether it's possible. They're trying to do the Brixton Pound, but one of the problems with the Brixton Pound they're finding is um, it's very difficult to isolate what is, although Brixton is recognisably a place, to get the coherence, because obviously Brixton is just part of London. Whereas if you've got Totnes or Stroud, you've got, a, you've got a, a, a sort of identity there that makes it possible. So it may be possible at the town level, but it may not be possible. They're trying it at Bristol at the moment to do it at city level. It may even be possible at Bristol level, but it's certainly not possible in part of a city. It's not, I don't, I'm not so confident as part of a city, like Brixton being part of London. I think that's much, much more difficult. So you need a boundary to your, to your local economy. You need to know where it starts and where it stops. So um, let's think about the next level, and that was the local money. And not to, not to put local money down, but it, because it has been hugely successful at times, and it has been long li living, like Ithaca hours, um, but it, 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 it does have, you know, like I say, some limitations. Um, so how about the national money? And this is really where I've been focusing in these, in the, in these lectures. On the, on the national system, of reclaiming the national money system. Because, again, I think you might have seen this slide before, the state is now seen as parasitic on the private money-creating sector, which is quite literally that, as we've learnt. The private sector is the money-creating sector. And yet we know that the public, the state in, in, in the name of the public, also underpins that sector. We, we, we've learnt that, we know that, and we've seen it. The crisis has shown it. There's nothing, there is no other game in town apart from cent central banks and public authorities. There isn't anything else. And uh, we're still, that, that still hasn't been admitted by the, the policy makers at the moment. They just aren't accepting <coughs> that that is all we've got in, to, to underpin a money system. Now, we know that money issue at present is privatised and issued as debt, and we know why that's a problem. We've, we've, we've gone through all that. We know the current system is crisis-ridden and dominated by financial speculation and is going on like that because nobody can envisage what an alternative would be. But we do know that trust in money is based on legal tender. That is, we trust the money because in the end, the money, no matter what form it takes, whether it's your electronic records in your bank account or whether it's what you've got in your wallet, we know that that will be honoured as national tender. And this is what the states have had to do. They've had to back all the deposits, all the accounts that people have, uh, because <coughs> that is the only thing in the end where people will trust. And we've seen that happen. We saw that with Ice Save, we saw that with Northern Rock, we saw it with all the, um, all the Irish banks. We, we know that in the end, it's the authority, it's the legal nature of money that is actually all that people trust in the end. So how can we de democratise national money as the focus for large-scale collective social action, sufficiency. How can we do it? Well, I think I've made this obvious to you in what I've said before. I think we've got to reclaim the issue of money as a public matter. We've got to reintroduce debt-free fiat money issue to avoid the banking problems we got into. And I hope I've proved to you the fact that the debt-based money system is very recent, particularly its dominance. It's only about 30 years old. Before that, there was a substantial amount of uh, pu a public money issue. The figures, uh, figures jump about actually because people retrospectively find it difficult to calculate. Um, the figures uh, that the, the, the seminar yesterday were that 40% in the 1960s was still state issued. I've seen figures down as low as 15%. Uh, so again, I, I, <coughs> it's very difficult to. I don't think it, the exact amount is, is the issue here or when exactly the bank debt overtook. The private, uh, the public money. The point is that through history, public authorities have issued money, and that it's only recently that public authorities have not issued money. And we do know they are issuing money again because of quantitative easing. Uh, so what I think we need to do is link fiscal and monetary policy. These should not be separate. Um, 
the present system money separates what we call fiscal policy, that is tax and public expenditure, from monetary policy, which is monetary issue, which is done via the private system, monetary control and, uh, and the connection is independent central banks. Making the banks independent uh, gave the, <coughs> did the ultimate in separating monetary and fiscal uh, policies. Now, a democratised money system, and I think we have to democratise money, uh, would integrate fiscal and monetary policy. That is, we would issue the money through public expenditure, or at least a substantial part of it would be issued through public expenditure, which is how it historically always was issued. And, or it need be necessarily through state expenditure, but it should be through publicly determined mechanisms, which could be local money, could be community development banks, could be citizens' income, it could be cooperative, um, it could, it could be cooperative developments, it could be green investment bank, it could be a lot of a lot of things, and some of it could be issued as debt. There's no reason why uh, it, it, you you shouldn't have effectively revolving loan funds, um, but the question is that this wouldn't be left to the private financial system to determine. It would be a matter of public debate. How much of our economy? Are we going to issue a citizen's income? How much are we going to issue through investment banks? How much are we going to issue through pr a private sector, if the private sector is still going to function? How much do we issue as state expenditure? Uh, how much do we issue as regional development? How much do we issue as green development? These should be the policy issues that we should be having. Um, so monetary control then would, would be through the taxation system, not through what it is done now, which is interest rates, open markets uh, operations, buying and selling of public debt, all the things that the um, central bank is doing at the moment. Monetary control would be through taxation because you, money would be removed from society through the taxation process if there was excess money in the system and there was goods and services to meet. And obviously if you're doing a lot of infrastructure work, you would, or, or a lot of um, work which doesn't uh, uh, involve immediate payment, like the health service, then obviously you pay a lot of money out through the health service, you pay a lot of money out through the education system, you pay a lot of money out building bridges, building roads, and when that gets into the economy, there's only a limited amount of goods and services that that money uh, is needed for, and so therefore you use taxation to claw the money back in. Um, taxation could also be used to redistribute wealth, and encourage ecologically or socially desirable activities and penalise socially undesirable and ecologically undesirable activities. I do think that you would, you would need, as well as public decision-making about the balance of how this money should be issued, I think you would need to have some technical um, determination of monetary balance. That is, you, 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 I, there's room for an independent authority not to be controlling the money system, but to be advising on the level of, of, of money that could be issued in the different sectors and to give advice. I don't think that should determine it, but I think an independent authority to, 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 um, to give, give wise advice on the balance between the systems and whether it's likely to be inflationary or it's likely to be deflationary would be important. But I think the main thing is we should have dem democratic determination of expenditure and investment priorities. For, um, and as examples, Iceland has taken back state money issue following the collapse of all its banks. And the Channel Islands, have been, for a long time, have been issuing money for public projects. Uh, which they, So they issue new money for public projects, and they tax it back over time. So it's perfectly possible, and, it, uh, and a lot of societies that still issue a lot of notes and coin will be doing this as well. And a lot of countries still have public banks, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, have a public banking system how much they regulate it. It's not an answer in itself, because Germany's got a lot of public and, and, and cooperative banks, and a lot of them got involved in dodgy dealing as well. So um, it's not a, just a changing ownership isn't an end in itself if you don't change what the banks actually do. Um, and what, change what the banks actually do means reclaiming um, a pu public money issue rather than leaving it as, um, as being done on speculative basis. So what would democratic money do? It would prioritise socially necessary expenditure and it would be a one-step economy with un no unnecessary growth. At the moment, as I said before, if you want to earn, if you want to, um, uh, earn money, you have to do whatever the economy thinks is profitable. You don't necessarily do what you most want to do or, or what is the most uh, provisioning activities. You have to do what the people who borrow the money and speculate 
think is going to make them money. So that's a two-step economy. You do something you don't want to do in order to earn the money to do what you do want to do. So you've got much more chance, if we prioritise socially necessary expenditure, of doing, of doing something as your, as your work that directly benefits you or somebody else in society, that is actually meeting people's needs. So uh, I've already mentioned the fact we should have democratic control of priorities for expenditure and investments through specialist banks or regional banks. I've talked about citizen income as another priority. Now, what, would there be a private sector? I think there's plenty of room for a private sector, but it should be completely... Uh, it should be what it says it does now. It should be private. It should take people's savings and invest them. And the people who let their savings be taken for investment should know that is at risk. That is what capitalism is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be investment at risk. And you get benefit. You, if, because you risk your money, you get some benefit for it, if it obviously if it's successful. Um, so basically, there the, the could well, there's no, no, pr no problem having, having a private sector, provided that it doesn't have control of money issue, and providing that um, it, uh, it, 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 it's a, what they call a 100% reserve system, in the sense that the money is put into the system and it comes out as and when debts are, are paid and profits are made or whatever it might be. Um, so that takes us a little bit into the public-private pro thing. And now at the moment we've got a big problem with the private sector, for instance, in the health service reforms, private sector meeting public need. Now I think, um, I think there's a problem with private sector meeting public need from the point of view of wastefulness, that is uh, competition, which means uh, uh, you, you know, uh, you, you have different companies setting up all their equipment or whatever it may be, or multiple training, and that seems to be wasteful of resources. So I think competition is, in that sense is wasteful uh, as opposed to cooperation. But I think the problem with it, more problem with it at the moment now, is the private sector um, not only is providing the services, but because it's creating the money and controls the money supply, it's determining what public expenditure can be as well. I think it would be a different matter if it was the public that was issuing the money and that the private sector could not get its hands on that money except by earning it. And I, so I think there may be a way of rebalancing the public-private partnerships and uh, the public-private procurement. Um, I think we could look into that uh, in more detail. I think we need to do something about global money. The current system we know is dominated by reserve currencies. I think we've got to remove the power of reserve currencies and even out the inequalities of international trade. And this would reduce the amount of international trade because a lot of it is just done on things like labour values and currency values. It's nothing to do with the fact. So you get uh, a load of cars taken from one part of the world to another part of the world and a load of cars brought back. You know, totally wasteful in terms of resources and totally wasteful in terms of people's lives. Um, so I think we need to even out that and Keynes was obviously looking for this with the idea of the Bancor and uh, trying to balance, get more balance in international trade so that, I don't know if he was trying to limit it, but he was trying to get more balance. I would like to limit international trade. I think it should be only done when uh, necessary um, and uh, only it should be a minority of things. Local areas should try and become as self-sufficient as possible. But I, I think you need a source of global money supply and um, I think you need a global money, and I don't think currencies should interact directly with each other. I think they should go, as Keynes wanted, via a global currency, via a mechanism that equalises the benefit. There's a lot of green suggestions of an energy <coughs> basis for currency. Keynes suggested a global basket of currencies as the basis of his. I would, I'm working on the idea of linking um, the exchange rate between because obviously if you put, a, if you put a, a money system in between local money systems, then uh, what's the exchange rate mechanism in and out of different systems? And I think it should be based on some kind of median income. Uh, so that each, e each economy pays for things in its own currency and at the rate appropriate for its own economy. I was thinking of the hourly rate or median income or something of that order. So that... Um, Nigeria would pay for things in a rate, say, equivalent to 100 times uh, the basic wage, and America would pay for the same thing 100 times its basic rage, wage, so the Americans would pay much more than the Nigerians in absolute terms, 
but in terms of their economies, they're paying the same. So I think you know that that would equalise this unequal um, uh, incomes and unequal uh, and as well unequal currencies. I'm working on that, but I think something like that needs to be done. So let's just summarise. I've I, I hope I've made the case that I that money is a public resource, and it should be um, uh, therefore publicly controlled or public or related to. The, to, 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 to public questions. Money issued through bank loans is producing a publicly guaranteed national resource. We've, we've taken that quite a lot. Now, the money, cre whoever creates the money gets this thing that you offer uh, to the monetary reform people talk of as seniorage, in the sense that whoever creates the money gets first use of it and they direct the direct, they, they, um, this leads to directing the economy in certain areas. And I think that the public should have the first right to money issue and the public should spend the money for its purposes first. And then the private sector, the profit-oriented sector, should be secondary to that. So we need to reclaim money as a public resource with democratically determined priorities, that's what I've been saying up to now, which I think creates the possibility of a sufficiency steady state economy. Because people will have no need to go grasping for money because... The, 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 the public expenditure will priority, prioritise their needs. So we have production for need, not profit. Provisioning on the basis of sufficiency and minimise the ecological costs of production and distribution. We need to broaden the, means, the meaning of economy to internalise all those excluded aspects of human life and ecological questions and recognise the needs of the environments and other species in the way we approach our provisioning. So money access should be a democratic right, as should the right to meaningful work. So the citizen income and the obligation to meaningful work as well. I mean, if we are a money-issuing system, then we expect people to participate to provide the goods and services, but not have to make work. If there is not a lot of work to go around and certain people want to do it and certain people don't, fair enough. Um, if um, uh, The idea of, of forcing people to work before they can get an income, I think that is terribly wasteful. I mean, if there's jobs to be done, get them done. If there's no jobs to be done and you can feed your population sufficiently and you can uh, provision your population, then why hassle people to do things they don't want to do? Um, the use of socially issued money then should prioritise economic activity, social need, public services. Any residual market system would be regulated and serve the, the needs of a, uh, demands of a needs-led economy, a needs-led provisioning economy. So, and this, I think this is the last slide. I, I hope I've proved to you that I think money is the most socially based institution in our society. It's not a natural thing. It's not a private thing. It's not an economic thing. And I see money as, uh, and I think it should be seen as a commons, uh, a social resource commons, like air or water is a natural resource. And it should not be privatised or privately accumulated. Having money in the way we've got it at the moment leaves no basis for enough. Um, as an example, oh, I've talked about the fact that the people who have money, who are hoarding money, they never seem to have enough. They're never satisfied. They, they hate paying their taxes. They hate being, they hide the money. They squirrel it. And why do people do that? It's because, of course, money doesn't destroy. Money doesn't uh, dissolve. Um, so, so, uh, so, and, uh, and I, I think I might have posed this question before. If I say to you, uh, you know, in 20 years' time, how much money do you need to provide you with enough bread? You haven't got a clue. If I say in 20 years' time, how much bread will you need and you will have it, then you, you feel quite secure. So it's not the money that... We, we've said this before. A sound money isn't the answer. A sound society is the answer. I've said that many times. Sound money is an illusion because money isn't a thing anyway. It is only a social relationship.